I'm so delighted to introduce Dr. Patricia Sauber. She is a founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of the Dr. Wei Zin. Dr. Sauber is a renowned internal medicine and emergency physician. She has an MBA and is also an entrepreneur. After being a highly sought after consultant to the federal government, health plans, and large employers. She was a senior physician executive at Kaiser and Blue Shield and has both in-depth and wide ranging medical related experiences in many areas of healthcare, including health policy. She is indeed a thought leader and an influencer. Over 15 years, the Dr. Weizian has gained respect and stature from medical professionals, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and other mental health clinicians, health policy experts, academics, and government experts in healthcare. By the way, she was a practicing physician for many years before she had all this variety of experience. So can I call you Pat? Yeah, call me Pat. <laughs> Hi, Pat. Can you tell us about the history of the, the Dr. Weizing website and the ups and downs? Sure. So when I started the Dr. Weizing 15 years ago, we were amongst the very earliest bloggers. And it started as a diet and weight loss site. I mean, those were the very early days of online weight loss programs. And, um, it, and, and in those days, in the very early days, uh, writing a blog was 250 words or 500 words and you did it off the top of your head. So it, it was very different than it is today. And over the years, we've grown um, the Dr. Ways in from that uh, kind of uh, uh, personal blog about diet and weight loss to one that now has uh, multiple authors, uh, mainly physicians and an audience uh, around the world. So we've made a uh, huge progress. It took 15 years, but, um, but we've done it. And we're competing in what now, as we'll talk about later, is um, a much different world than it was 15 years ago, as is true in all things. Yeah, you bet. Now, so what are the immediate challenges with running an independent website with a large audience in a very competitive space? Well, there are a lot of challenges, but I would say the first one is that it really requires a lot of resources. You know, in the old days, you could be on an inexpensive server. You didn't really worry about how much traffic you had. And as I said, you didn't spend all that much time on your content. Now you really have to not only be on a high quality, fast server so that that you that you 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 don't end up annoying your readers by uh, loading too slow, but you also have to invest a lot of money in understanding uh, what kinds of issues your site is having with respect to being found in search, and that turns out to be very complicated. There's actually a huge industry of people. Sometimes I feel like as as the publisher. We create what it's all about. We create the content. And then there's this whole universe of companies that have grown up around the website to try and help figure, help people figure out how to rank well in Google search. Now here, my question is, which is the chicken, which is the egg? Uh, this ecosystem, this, this huge uh, so-called the support system, support uh, services, were they created by Google, by the demand for, for, for ranking high? Google stimulated their creation because um, starting a number of years ago, uh, when they first started doing significant updates um, that actually ended up having names like Panda and Penguin, um, and what they did was they made really big changes in their search algorithm which of course nobody knows the algorithm secret because they don't want us gaming that. Um, and when they made these changes, there were people who had their traffic disappear overnight, never to return again. So, so people started looking for help. And a lot of this is very technical. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a physician. You can talk to me about anything in medicine. But when I had to start learning about um, content shift and you know, all this other very technical stuff, it was difficult. 
And I'm sure it is for most people who run their websites. So then you started hiring people or you started hiring companies. You have contracts with companies that help you audit your site and help you correct, um, identify and correct these technical issues. So it's, it's quite complex and quite expensive. Uh, imagine you were playing a ball game and, and it was really important. It was the national championship, <laughs> but you didn't know what the rules were. I mean, it may be that the guy with the lowest score wins instead of the guy with the highest score. You just don't know what the rules are. You can see how difficult that is. Um, and you can also see why people created companies to say, hey, I'm going to figure out what, what, what the rules are ahead of time. I don't really know, but I position myself as an expert and I tell you, and people pay a lot of money to get that advice. And, and, and these people are really good and thoughtful and, um, and have contributed to what, you know, you know to the search engine optimization space. But for the people on the receiving end, you know, once you've optimized to one thing, then boom, another algorithm comes and they've decided that something else is what they want uh, to focus on. And, and I, I realize when I read what Google says that what they're trying to do is to drive to ever increasingly be able to understand the intent of someone's search and, and, and to deliver closely to what they think you intended to do. And they're using a lot of technology to do that. I, I'm not sure sometimes when I look at search results that I agree with them when I you know, I was in Europe before the pandemic and I was searching for, a, you know, best restaurant in Amsterdam and, and a list of restaurants that were uh, ranked uh, as good restaurants from 2015 showed up. Mm. You know, to me, that's not relevant, right? So they, they're, they're certainly, they certainly have a ways to go before they get this, um, before they get this right. I've also done searches where my story comes up number one and the story right behind me, and this is another challenge for us. You ask about technical challenges. The story right behind me is from a site that has basically stolen my material. They, they do it with bots. And within seconds of me putting my story up, it appeared on this you know, spammy site and it ranked number two. So I created the content, I ranked number one, but number two is a site that just stole it from me. You know, I mean, these are these are huge cha challenges. And then there's an issue that I believe you know about, Joanne, which is called backlinks. Google says, I believe this site is good because look how many, you know, good sites link into it, right? And, and it isn't the only thing they use now, but in the early days, it was a very important ranking signal. As far as we can tell, it still is. There are actually now organizations that go out and and overwhelm your site with bad links. I had a thousand links show up on my site in December alone. And a huge number of them were from these kind of scraping sites or there was even there were even porn sites that were linking to me. There's no reason for a porn site to, to link to my site. Um, and, and they send a message. So Google not only wants to see you have good links, they punish you if you have bad links. So just technical issue after technical issue. Uh, and, and then this new thing where it's gonna be highly technical. I mean, this is technical at the level of, of you know, when you try and figure it out, you have to go over to, you know, use development tools to, to figure it out. Um, and, and that means you have to hire somebody. Right, yeah. And this is prevalent for um, all industries? Well, certainly. I mean, every algorithm, uh, all the big algorithms have had kind of different focuses. So uh, in June of 2019, they called it your money or your life. So it was financial and health sites that were targeted mainly, and everybody else was pretty much left alone. Mm -hmm. um, they, in the early days um, when they did, um, it might have been Panda, I can't remember which one it was, they uh, targeted, um, you know, sites that, that were kind of doing sleazy selling, you know, they, they really didn't have content. They were just doing sleazy selling techniques. And um, in the 2019 um, uh, June update with the health, they really went after the alternative sites. So sites that if I said to you their names, which, which I'm not going to, were actually very popular sites um, in the kind of alternative medicine, nutritional supplement space. And they got hit really, really very hard in, in that algorithm. Mm -hmm. well, well, I don't think anybody gets left out. Sometimes they're broad algorithms, sometimes they're industry focused, but, um, you know, a, a, in, during the uh, 
like when they did that, the, your money and your health, there was a financial site that had something like 180 employees. And after they got hit, they just folded up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you ask what it's like. Yeah. Hey, you took all my traffic away. That means you took all my revenue away and I got employees and I can't pay them. I'm, I'm just going to quit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, from Google's point of view, it seems to be that they are scrutinizing the health site and the fintech site because they are related to people's actual physical health and i mean people's lives are at stake and well that's what they said yeah that's that that's what that was what they said is this is so important in people's lives we have to make sure that they get trustworthy information right okay uh, so here other than site speed what has to be done to compete online Oh, you have to do it all. <laughs> you know, if it was only site speed, I'd spend all my time on site speed. No, you have to have you have to have really good content. Your uh, your site has to be considered to have either, you know, expertise, authority, and trust. But each of your authors, you have to show that each of your authors is somebody who would be trusted to write on the topic that they've written on. So you have to do that whole piece. Mm -hmm. Then you have to do this whole thing around the backlinks and these other technical things like. Um, it used to be that they tell you know people would say you should do a change your links so that so that the Google bot doesn't follow them and now they're saying oh no no they should actually be able to follow them it's all sorts of little nitpicky stuff but if you have a thousand active pages it's a lot of work and then and then this last piece that's coming up soon which I think is the the job for us in the next um, four to five months is is conquering these. Um, the site speed, uh, particularly something called core web vitals, which which Google has been signaling, and I'm taking it seriously. I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know anybody who isn't uh, that that's going to be an important part of a of an upcoming algorithm, maybe as early as May. So you know you're, you're going to scramble to do that. And I have to say that each one of these things, I, I believe that Google's doing it because in in their heart, if an organization has a heart, they think that they're improving the web. And the experience for consumers, uh, I'm just not sure that it always plays out that way. It's leaving the content creators in a bit of a pickle because, again, we're trying to play without understanding the rules, and the stakes are high. I see. Okay, so I want to um, remind all of us that this is recorded right after the impeachment, the second impeachment of Donald Trump, and. I would say uh, we need to be mindful that the monsters that created the Capitol Hill uh, insurrection, one of which, one of the monsters is social media disinformation, misinformation. And the algorithm, I, I heard this, okay, uh, from a reputable source that uh, the, the Facebook algorithm, you know, uh, other platforms have similar issues. The Facebook algorithm sort of encourage people and even recommend uh, the extreme groups to connect to <coughs> some other similar extreme groups. They, you know, if you're interested in certain extreme point of view, they recommend you to join some, you know, dangerous groups. And then, and also the echo chamber uh, that we only hear people who share our own views so, and reinforcing. So instead of having information, it's like affirmation. You're just affirming your own points of view. And then if it's completely twisted and manipulated, in this case, it is true. Um, I mean, that creates this complete polarization of, of our landscape, a political landscape, you know, and people's way of digesting and selecting information. Um, I, I would like you to weigh in because you, you know so much about these uh, technical areas of of people getting information. So well, what I, I remind, you're, you're reminding me to say um, one thing people have to understand about algorithms, they act like they're, I don't know, some kind of independent, completely fair thing that maybe a machine created it. But even AI in healthcare, the algorithms are created by and tested by people. And we now know in healthcare that there are inherent biases that get built into the algorithms. And the algorithms can also be manipulated. So I think what you were talking about where um, people who had a certain radical point of view and how they could end up in an echo chamber and that becomes their reality, that wasn't a neutral algorithm. There was 
whether you use the word manipulation or whether you use the word influence, but there, there were people mm -hmm. who made that happen, right? It didn't just happen. It just didn't just drop out of algorithm heaven, you know? And, um, and so that's really important to keep in mind, not, not just with search and not just with social media, but almost everywhere that algorithms are driving what's happening. And, and, and algorithms are the basis for AI, for artificial intelligence. So it's something we all need to be concerned about. And I think at some point we're gonna to have to say that search and social media have become so important in people's lives. Can this really be left to the sole discretion of a handful of people at the top of giant tech companies? And I know we're starting to hear that 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 argument now, and you can weigh in on both sides. But I I think that um, that there that there are certainly concerns that that it manipulates us in ways that are much more powerful and much more important and much more destructive than we would have thought at the beginning of this whole social media era. I was a big social media fan, and now I'm much more cautious about what I do on social media. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you that the self-perpetuating snowballing effect, the, 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 the exponential uh, people feed um, misinformation because um, it is said that uh, lies uh, spread six times faster than truth on social media. Uh, so people, they create their own realities, alternative realities. Uh, detached from the truth. So this is going to sacrifice truth and science. And now just look at the way uh, people are uh, um, the, regarding about mask wearing. It's so political sized, okay? I mean, it's a very simple science thing. And the truth about the election, whether it was truly stolen or not, you know, so this is just really dangerous. I think we have come to the limit of this unchecked, and uh, completely out of control, social media feeding itself and people feed on, on lies until it's just like a house of cards collapse on itself. I think uh, it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge of the next decade. I mean, we have so many challenges of the next decade. Of course, we have to conquer the pandemic. We have to recover the economy. Uh, we have to get through this political situation. As you and I are speaking today, uh, the Capitol is shut down with military all over the place. It does not look like the United States of America. Uh, but once we're through those things, we do have to grapple um, with these big issues of monopolies and oligopolies controlling resources that are so important in our society yes. that they can actually drive this kind of radicalization. Because you said, oh, people create their own reality. I would suggest to you that for many people, those realities are created by other powerful people with an agenda. And I know that sounds conspiratorial, but you look at QAnon, for example, supposedly there is a guy or a woman, there is a person who is Q, right? And, and we know how big QAnon has become. So uh, it's just an issue that we have to grapple with. And I, unfortunately, I'm not sure that we yet have the, the, the willpower, number one, you know, the, the, the willingness, and that we have the knowledge of what to do because it's such new territory. Mm -hmm. So what are the future projections given the, comp the competition for Google first page? and the increasing advertisements and more and more competitors are, are vying for the limited attention of the audience. So what, what do you foresee the future of this running your independent website? Well, so I, I want to I stop and talk about first what is, what's going on now. Mm -hmm. uh, so anybody who's done search recently realizes that it's very different from the way it was when Google first started. Remember, Google came on the scene when, when we were using things like Yahoo to try and figure out how to you know, get what we wanted to on the web. And initially it was all about helping people get to information. But over time, just like everything else is involved in the internet, uh, Google has, has made search a big business for them. So what you see now when you do a search, which is different from the old days when, 
when getting to number one on Google used to be the mantra. That was that when you did a search, your story showed up first in the search results. Yay, that was great. But now what happens if you do a search for almost any topic, there may be some that this isn't true, is you'll get four to six. And the other day I had two pages mm -hmm. of paid Google ads before you got to the first search result. And then the first search result now is a thing that comes in a box. It's called a featured snippet. That now has to title position zero. And being position zero is better than being position one. So all this work to become position one in organic search kind of went out the window. And then after that, they started developing, people also ask. So there are a bun bunch of questions about the topic and then a bunch of answers. Mm -hmm. So the result of that is if you do a search, and let's say you're not looking for anything particularly complicated, you want, you want kind of a quick answer, you will get your quick answer from the featured snippet and the questions people ask, and you will never click over even to the site that was chosen to have the featured snippet for whose, answers, for, for whose um, answer actually solved what you were looking for. So it, the result is that half of all Google search are now what they call clickless. Nobody ever clicks over to the website. The people who produce the content have their content in position zero, kind of a yay, but they don't get a click. And it's the clicks, depending on your revenue model, that drives everything. Well, it actually drives things besides that. It, it, it tells the world how important you are. Um, it drives ads if you have ads because it's page views that drive the ads. It just drives everything. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different world for, for people who are trying to publish. And it makes it really diff difficult for independents because in my field, the health field, the people who dominate, the companies who dominate health search are huge. Um, almost all of them, I would say literally all of them, are owned by multinational brand organizations. So they have very deep pocket pockets. They can afford to do all of the technical stuff so that their, you know, use, your user experience should be superior, but they can also afford to dump a whole bunch of money into Google ads. So they they'll they'll get you on the organic search and they and they and they get your eyes on on uh, by buying Google ads. And I, I recently read about a company, it's not in my field, it's in the beauty space, um, fairly new company that was spending $44,000 a month on Google ads. And I'm sure these big guys spend more than that, but for a relatively small company, I'd say $44,000 a month is a pretty significant investment. Mm -hmm. Now I have two questions. Number one is recently, somebody filed a lawsuit um, claiming that Google has been prioritizing YouTube because it owns YouTube. So YouTube has more favorable treatment than others. So it's not a level playing field for everybody. And I'm sure Google would, would deny that uh, there is any relationship between spending money on Google ads versus your positioning, you know, your ranking. But I doubt whether um, that um, is really going to hold the water. So the second question is, you mentioned about the clickless search, search, click, click, search. Yes. Do you think it has something to do with the way people are writing content? Because they, they create a snippet and they use a snippet, snippet, snippet to summarize the entire article. Basically, people don't have to spend the time reading through the article to figure out what the answers. Well, the irony of it is, first of all, yes, you're right. People are writing because, you know, after we what we replaced, let's get to position zero with what I mean, to position one with was let's get to position zero. So everyone wanted to own position zero, which meant you wrote things for to be the featured snippet. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's kind of backfired on people because you wanted to be the featured snippet because you were hoping people would would see that you were the featured snippet that you were considered really good in search, in search. You were the most relevant to answer the person's search query only to find out now that your very own material is being used to answer the question and that people don't have to click over to your site. So it's pretty ironic. Yes. So that leads to another philosophical question because I know some really good writers, they need to play the game of the search engine 
and their creativity, the storytelling, the colorfulness is all gone. So it's almost like a formula. You write a blog and they get rid of all the lead and the introduction and lay the ground for the story because those are not uh, going to be valuable keywords for the Google search engine. So everything is written in according to a formula. And now this formula is actually punishing themselves. Yeah, I, yes, it, you're absolutely right. Yes, I think, I think it has made us much more formulaic. Um, it's had us playing to, to what we think the rules are. Because first of all, I want to tell you the hard thing about all of this is nobody really knows what the rules are. Right. Nobody when they, they do core updates and people get wiped out and they want to figure out what to do, um, they have to turn to outside organizations whose job it is to guess what was in the algorithm. What do you think happened based on the res results that you see and how can I use that to get better? So it's um, I mean, it's really difficult to do, you know, if you want to play by the rules, but you don't know what the rules are. What do you do? Right. Start uh this is a big problem, the monopoly, okay? They can change whatever the rules they want. So everybody says you can never game the algorithm of Google as if it is the ironclad law, okay? But the, the problem is there is going to be a vast amount of people and businesses who will suffer every time they change algorithm. You're right. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, if you look at the health field, as, as what's happened is that the dominant players are these huge multi, multinationally funded uh, organizations. Um, we're going to end up with five or six, maybe four or five. Um, and that's going to be your choice for search because, because they're the ones that are going to show up at the top. Remember, you had to get through the ads and the featured snippets and the questions and answered. And now you've got, maybe you made it onto the next page if you were persistent as a searcher. And now you see all the big players. And, and I'm not saying the big players don't do a great job. Some of them have, you know, fabulous sites, but it really has, it really has eliminated choice. If what you were looking for was not encyclopedic health information, but rather health information, you know, um, based on personal stories, um, what, what, whatever you were looking for, but it wasn't just what those four or five have. It's very difficult now um, for that. And and, and if people persist and they went to page two and page three, maybe some of these would survive, but I've already told you, number one, it's very expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to recover if you've ended up, you know, knocked down to page two or three. And so, and so some, some people are going to quit. And, you know, when they quit, I know after the big update in 2019, a lot of health sites just closed their door. Some financial sites just closed their door. Well, those people hired people. They have people working for them. Mm -hmm. So that's that's jobs. It's not just someone's income. It's it's the income of all the people who are involved in, in helping that person to run the site. Right. And consumers eventually will end up getting less variety and uh, less choices of, uh, of voices online. Do you think Google, social media are sort of a monsters out of control? Is it a winner take his... Uh, you know, takes it all landscape for only the few big players. Is Google the uh, monopoly or the oligopoly that is making only the extremely well-funded competitors, so-called competitors, to win and all others to lose? Well, you know, of course, I don't know because most of us don't know that much about, you know, the ins and outs of Google. But I can tell you that the Google algorithm is so important for most people who rely on organic search. By organic search, I mean I don't pay mm -hmm. to have my to get to get you to see that I'm when when you search for me, I haven't paid. I get it because I earned my position organically by following <laughs> what is rumored to be the, the rules. Um, of course, I could pay, and there are a lot of people who do pay, and they pay, and they pay Google, which is which is interesting, right? Um, but I do worry that that this um, by funneling people or by fun by funneling search into just a small number of answers, and I know they say they're doing it because you they 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 know they can trust these sites, but um, you know we need to have other ways to be trusted. For example, there is a thing called an on H-O-N for honor certification that you could get. All the big sites have it. 
I have been trying to apply for it for months. You, you, you cannot apply, the, the applications are closed. So if that becomes something that says you're a good site and somebody who doesn't have it, you're a bad site, then you know it's actually closed to people right now. Oh, why? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm going to look into it, but it's in Switzerland. Huh. Okay. Well, uh, without spending tens of thousands of dollars of Google ads and everything else, will you be able to thrive on featuring others' ads alone? Um, no, it, it isn't. Uh, it isn't a good long-term strategy. And people who make money on their blogs, a lot of them do it because they have they belong to affiliate programs, which we do. We don't do a lot of affiliate advertising, but they belong to, uh, say, Cardia. You've seen that EKG that's advertised a lot, the little handheld EKG that's advertised on television a lot. You can join that affiliate program, try and sell the Cardia on your site, and make you know some pennies off, off of that. So people do that. They write eBooks. They, a lot of people who make money from the internet, internet do it based on their reputation. So they, they start doing consulting or they um, give speeches. You know, they have lots of other ways to do it. But if you, if you wanna just create a dynamite resource for people that's online and you're trying to pay for it with ads, not gonna happen. For most of us, it's not gonna happen if you're dependent on organic search. Mm -hmm. Speaking of ads, I'm, I'm personally very annoyed when I read uh, a news article and there is this, ah, so much distractive ad taking away from the substance, substantive content. And uh, is this out of control? It, well, <laughs> you, you know, I agree. I, I fought having ads for a long time. Um, I probably have too many ads on the site, but it was finally generating some decent revenue. And uh, the problem is now these all these ads that appear that cause a technical issue that Google has already announced that that technical issue is going to be one of the things that they address in their next update. If that if that's the case, that's the, the rumor is next May um, this problem that the ads cause, which which is kind of shifting content around on your site, is going to become an important issue. So then you'll be stuck with oh, that's a major revenue source for me, but it's driven by my traffic, <laughs> but um, I have to get rid of that major revenue source in order to keep my traffic. So it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, and the traffic depend, depends on the click, click rate. Well, no. the, the traffic generates the clicks. The, tra the traffic depends on, on, on showing up. They call them SERPs, that little that little sentence or two that's written about, like I'll have the title of your story and then there's a sentence or two after it. Mm -hmm. That's that's called the SERP. And um, the traffic is driven, organic traffic, not paid traffic, organic traffic is driven by what position your SERP is on. So if your SERP is number 100, basic, basically you're not gonna get any traffic. Mm -hmm. not, not gonna get organic traffic from Google. You may get it from Bing, which, you know, doesn't really account for that much of the traffic. You may get it because you're advertising on Facebook, but you won't be getting it because people stumbled across your your URL on page on position number one hundred. Okay, I'm talking about maybe there's another catch twenty two within the catch twenty two, and which is, if people are not clicking it, then you the traffic doesn't mean anything. It won't. Well, that's it. <laughs> you, you bingo, you got it. Yeah, you know what it did is it, it reinforced Google's position mm -hmm. as the purveyor, the owner of knowledge, even though they didn't create the knowledge. Yes, they are all the time. But but the problem, the problem is in this particular space is the person who created the content basically is getting nothing. It's kind of like it's kind of like taking my book and stealing it despite having a copyright and selling it and making a bunch of money on it. And by the way, I forgot to pay you. And we know that that's happened in, in, in the music industry for a long time where people hadn't gotten paid properly for their creative work. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pat, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, well, I've always wanted to be in medicine since I was a little girl. And when I got into medical school, 
because of the women's movement. Uh, it was a dream come true. And I've never fallen out of love with medicine, even though I don't practice medicine anymore. I practiced emergency medicine for 18 years. Then I did the business of medicine for another chunk of, of time. And that was really interesting. Then I did digital health, but all along in those latter years, I had the blog and I discovered that I, I really love um, not just content creation, but content curation and um, trying, to, trying to help be sure that consumers have access to reliable, trusted health information that's written by people with the kind of credentials who should have, you, you, would, you would want to have to write that information. And, and so the Dr. Ways In has become a passion for me. So it's my, it's my baby, I incubated it. I guess it's 15 years old now, it's my teenager, um, but it is my passion. Okay, so I asked this question uh, to all those I interview um, because I am a branding expert and I have the privilege of working with you to hone your brand. What does your brand stand for? So if I had to pick one word, I would say trust. And our tagline is your, your trusted resource for healthy living. And what we want to do, all the work that we have done over the last, intensively, I'd say over the last 18 months, has been around not just writing good content, but proving to you, the consumer, that our content is trustworthy. So we've um, quit using a lot of freelancers. We still have some freelancers, but all our articles are reviewed by physicians. Um, and, and that appears on the website. It tells you this was reviewed by such and such a, a doctor. And then for all of our doctors in particular, but all of our clinicians who write for us, we've made sure that they have the kind of bio that you can look at it and say, oh, yeah, I see why that person should be writing about whatever the topic is. We had somebody write about um, malnutrition who is uh, you know, a, a national expert in the topic that she was writing about. And, and, and we needed that to show up much more clearly. So, and we're gonna try and get that on certification or other certifications. So we can send a message to you, not just that I'm saying you can trust us, right? But, but exter there's external validation that you should be able to trust us. And I think that that's where we're gonna end up in healthcare and hopefully there will be room for a wide variety of people or sites that can come into the marketplace and say, we have reliable, trustworthy information told from different points of view, but nevertheless trustworthy. Oh, and by the way, one other thing we do now is all our news stories have um, reference lists. Mm. So we're starting, to look like, we're starting to look like an academic journal <laughs> written for consumers. Okay, so after surviving and thriving for 15 years with your unrelenting, tenacious fight, what do you need right now to continue the momentum and succeed? Well, what would help the most is if we had a partner who was equally passionate about what we're doing and wanted to help us expand our reach, say for example, with physicians, so a physician organization or a health plan, and we need uh, you know, an, an infusion of resources so that we can much more quickly get the work that we're doing to improve you know, not only how, how our site appears to the, to the reader in terms of being trustworthy, but that we can deal with all the technical ap aspects, which as I mentioned are, are not only complicated, but Google's already sent a message to us that you know, the first round in healthcare was you have to have eat expertise, authority, and trust. So everybody scrambled and they did all of that. And now you have to have certain technical aspects. So um, it, it's going to be very important that we're totally on top of it. And you got to get on top of it before the algorithm comes back. Because once the algorithm comes out, if you get zapped, it's very hard to dig back up to the top. I am just so inspired by your uh, willpower and your passion to not only uh, for practicing medicine, I, I mean, that's your lifelong passion, but also uh, for this passion of getting information, trusted information with so much disinformation and misinformation and commercially motivated information that are compromised. So this 
uh, drive uh, to get the truth, to tell the truth, to, to provide reliable health and wellness related information is just uh, so valuable, so appreciated by, by the world. And that is your legacy. My audience, any of you are interested in uh, either becoming a partner or investor in the Dr. Wei's in, um, please feel free to contact her. Thank you so much. And this is really important information and insights philosophically and socially, as well as technically for my audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sobo. You're welcome. And I want to thank you, Joanne, because uh, obviously this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I always enjoy talking to you. We've had some pretty incredible conversations recently. Yes, this is a tough time for all of us. And so much is at stake. I have never imagined that the survival of a democracy is at stake. Uh, we shall overcome. We shall overcome for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Take good care. You too. All right. Bye.